concluded that childhood exposure to indoor insecticides was linked to a nearly 50% increased risk of childhood leukemia and lymphoma. I decided I'd rather take my chances with roach-carried illnesses, but thankfully, there's almost always a way to take care of a problem without using dangerous chemicals. Does PETA advocate for roaches? If so, they may not like the advice I'm going to give now. Boric acid. The natural alternative answer for roaches is boric acid. It worked like a charm. Read about it and use caution. We haven't seen a single sign of roaches in the three years since. P.S. If your three-year-old knows there are roaches in your kitchen, so will everyone you meet. I know as well as anyone that you don't have control over all the things. Jason and I have found ourselves in some unique positions over the years of crunchifying our lives. And when I say unique, I don't mean glamorous. We have learned that having an artesian well sounds fancy, but means your water might smell like rotten eggs. We have learned that you can get rid of mice using massive amounts of dried tansy, bay leaves, peppermint, and lots and lots of prayer. We have learned that just because a flea-infested dog moves out of a place doesn't mean the fleas go with it. Most importantly, we have learned that sometimes you have to make the best of where you are. Roach infestation and all. 2. Water When we were full-time RVers, our vehicle decided to overheat while traveling through the Mojave Desert in July. I grew up with old vehicles, and I remembered my dad telling me to blast the heat in the cab to help cool an overheating engine. I don't know if that was good advice, but it's what we chose to do. So, there we were, blasting the heat, in July, in the desert, when we decided we needed to pull over to see if we could get the RV to cool down naturally. We felt stranded. There was nothing around. No cell signal. We didn't even have smartphones at this point in our lives, and we were using a shoestring and a road atlas to map our trips. Our poor dog, a collie, with the thickest, hottest coat imaginable, started looking uncomfortable as we sat there low-key panicking. So I opened her water container that we always had ready when traveling. As she lapped up the sweet, cool H2O, I, too, started to feel thirsty. I went to the fridge with high hopes, even though I knew the truth. There was nothing in our fridge. We chose not to pack anything to eat or drink because we'd planned to stop by a grocery store somewhere along the way. But there had been nothing along the way. My thirst magnified at this realization. I would have drunk from the dog bowl if I hadn't loved my dog too much to take her refreshment. My really very crunchy persona maybe even would have allowed me to try to drink from the lead-free hose if I could shake some water from it. Never the lead-laden one, though. My brother lived in Joshua Tree at the time, and that was where we were heading, so we decided to push the engine, with the heat blasting, until we got to his place. Once we arrived, we were able to get the RV to a repair shop, where the mechanic informed us that our temperature gauge was broken and our engine was perfectly fine. Wasn't it Leonardo da Vinci who said, Water is the driving force of all nature. It certainly was our force to drive on a fake hot engine. I will never take water for granted after that close call with thirsting to death. We all need water, but is water simply water anymore? A nine-month investigation by The Guardian and Consumer Reports showed evidence that it's not as pure as one would hope. More than 35% of the samples tested showed high levels of PFAS, which are forever chemicals. Forever chemicals are exactly what they sound like, chemicals that don't break down in our bodies or our environment. They are forever, and we all know forever is a very long time. These chemicals are everywhere. Clothes, I'm looking at you, yoga pants. Bedding, backpacks, tents, car seats, and furniture all commonly contain PFAS. PFAS are linked to learning delays in children, various types of cancer, and immunosuppression. If we are confronted with PFAS in every other area of our lives, why would we also want to be drinking them? This investigation also found arsenic in some water, and a total of 118 out of 120 samples tested showed levels of lead. Exposure to arsenic increases your chances of cancer. Lead exposure is unsafe at any level and is linked to brain and nervous system dysfunction. Aside from that study, here's a list of other hazardous things commonly found in tap water. 
Heavy metals, including chromium, cadmium, mercury, copper, and aluminum. It's pretty bad when all those things make up one bullet point instead of being separated out. Microplastics. PFAS, those pesky forever chemicals. Herbicides and pesticides. Yes, those have S's on the end of them. Bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Chlorine treatment byproducts. Arsenic. Nitrates. Radioactive contaminants. Vinyl chloride. Perchlorate. Pharmaceuticals. One hot topic debate I didn't mention on that list is fluoride. Fluoride is known to be effective in preventing tooth decay. It is also a known neurotoxin and can have a variety of health consequences when consumed at certain levels. Are those levels high enough in the community drinking water to be a concern? There are laws in place regulating the amount of fluoride that can be added. Personally, I don't want to risk consuming it, but the main reason I am anti-fluorinated water is that added fluoride does nothing for the quality of water. Adding fluoride takes away some freedom of choice because fluoride is added to water as a form of mass medication to treat the general public's teeth. If someone wants to use fluoride, they can do so with toothpaste, though there are natural options for tooth remineralization, such as hydroxyapatite. The idea of mass medication sounds more menacing than I mean. Am I saying I believe the government is using fluoride in water sources to control your mind? I'll leave that one for the conspiracy theorists. But do I like the idea of my health being influenced for the sake of the general population's dental health? Also, no. You don't have to be an extremist to have an opinion. On the topic of dental health. Floss is a major source of PFAS and plastic waste. There are tons of natural flosses out there, ranging from silk to bamboo. You can also practice tongue scraping for fighting bad breath. What do you think of when I say charcoal? Please don't say those toxic briquettes for grilling. Your answer should be charcoal powder, and you can use it for whitening your teeth instead of those plastic whitening strips. The good news is, water free from all the hazardous additives is accessible to almost everyone. You don't have to have a whole home filter for your water. You can buy a pitcher or even a countertop filter that will take out a lot of yucky stuff. Three, food. We all know the saying, you are what you eat, and I'm tempted to invoke that here, but the crunchy way of eating is high in quality fats, pasture-raised meats, and ferments, so to say that would be to say you should become a fat, wild animal who smells rotten. That's no way to convince someone to consider a lifestyle switch. As a side note, sauerkraut and kimchi smell rotten, but that doesn't mean they taste rotten. No one gives cheese connoisseurs a hard time for liking things that stink. I do have some advice from a non-cheese connoisseur. Don't try blue cheese for the first time on a cruise ship. I'm speaking from personal experience, and I'm not sure I can ever fully enjoy blue cheese, as it is forever tinged with the memory of the first impression I received upon the wonder of the seas. The flavor of rotten blue cheese is biting. Other lessons I learned on that cruise. 1. Don't go swimming when you're in a storm and the boat is causing the swimming pool to shift so much you can see the ground where the deep end is supposed to be. It was dangerously fun, though. 2. Older people are more fun to hang out with than young people. 3. The midnight pizza buffet is never a good idea. Food is a huge part of our lives. We all need to eat to survive. As with every topic of wellness, it can get a little tricky when you start choosing to go against the average acceptable norm for the sake of wanting to do better. I cringe as I type those words because doing better insinuates life is a competition and you are trying to do better than those around you. But what I mean by that is do better for yourself. Make better choices for you and your family, no matter what stage of life you're in. As with anything, you can take the focus of healthy eating too far where you become afraid of certain foods. This is called orthorexia. Do not be afraid of food. It's good to make healthy choices, but if making healthy choices, or an occasional not-so-healthy choice, causes mental distress, you may want to seek professional help. I try to be intentional about not making any foods an enemy, but rather being aware of and understanding the nourishment and benefits, or lack thereof, in foods I consume. A lot of talk about food can get muddled with words and phrases that are a bit confusing. But fear not, 
Here are a few words and phrases you can throw out in conversation to ensure that you sound like you know what you're talking about. Inflammation, the kryptonite of the crunchy person. Inflammation is the biological response against harmful stimuli such as toxins, bacteria, and food dyes. Immune response. The crunchy obsession with having a good immune system goes hand in hand with having as little inflammation as possible. Bonus words in this category include elderberry syrup, fire cider, and fermented honey and garlic. Microbiome. The trophy of a crunchy person. The microbiome should be rich and diverse. It is the bacteria that naturally live in and on our bodies and play a mega role in our health. Lacto-fermentation. This is an easy form of fermenting vegetables that, when consumed, increase the diversity of the ever-important gut microbiome. Natural and artificial flavorings. Crunchy people want their food to taste how it tastes without having to alter the flavor, so none of these, please. I know it's tricky because natural sounds natural. Really, it means part of the flavor was extracted from a natural source, but the result of the natural flavoring was still manipulated in a lab and often contains synthetic chemicals, preservatives, solvents, and emulsifiers added during the production process. How else do you think they get beaver anus to taste like raspberries? Just saying. Seed oils. These are the bane of the crunchy person's existence. Seed oils, including safflower, corn, soybean, canola, and cottonseed, all contribute to inflammation. Refer back to the first point in this list. Nose to tail. This means eating animal fats and organs. This is how our ancestors used to eat, not wasting any part of animals for food. Organ meats are full of nutrients, vitamins, and minerals that are easily digested and processed by our bodies. Bioavailability. A food may have a lot of nutrients and minerals, but our bodies aren't able to access all the nutrients in digestion. Bioavailable food allows our bodies to access its many health benefits. Still sounds a little pompous at times, even if it's true. If you've been around the health food world at all, you'll see that people referred to healthy eating as a lifestyle instead of a diet. A diet connotates something restrictive and is usually based on a timed goal. A lifestyle change is something deeper and more sustainable. The goal of healthy eating isn't to deprive yourself of all the things you love, but rather to shift your relationship with food and enlighten yourself on truly nourishing your body rather than merely feeding it.